When I was working in Sunnyvale, I once had an engineering manager who was very wise. And one of his sayings was, for every problem there is a solution that is quick, easy, inexpensive, and wrong. You have taken the verbal description of the problem and developed a state diagram from that description, in this case a four-state mealing machine, and from your next state tables and your Karnoff maps you have developed a schematic and you have built and tested your prototype. Well, things are going along pretty smoothly until in walks Mr. Hey, I can design anything better than you. And he looks at your schematic and your state diagram and your prototype and he says, Are you kidding me? It takes all those chips and all that circuitry to turn an LED off and on? Are you crazy? I can build that in just maybe one chip. I mean, don't we just have a state machine that's either off or on? It's like a light switch, you know, what's the big deal? Because, okay, sure, you have to press the button and release it and all that, but I'll figure out a way to do that. Just give me 15 minutes and I'll show you how it can be done. So he disappears off with his office, and here's what he comes back with. So he's not even gone 15 minutes. 10 minutes later, he comes waltzing back into your office with that smug look on his face, and he plops this down on your desk. And you look at this and your heart sinks. You go, holy mackerel, I think he's right. You know, this should do the job. Basically what he's done is he's taken the JK flip-flop. He's only using one of them, the, the J1. And he's tying J and K high. And we know that when we toggle the clock with the inputs high on both the J and the K, it will toggle the output. So when you hit the clock, Every time the clock sees a down edge, it should toggle the output. And by golly, it should work. I mean, this is all you need. He's just taking your pull-up resistor here. You push the switch, it pulls that high. It's normally low. So every time you push that switch, you're going to create an edge and toggle that LED. Wow, that looks pretty good. So off he goes and he says, as a matter of fact, Give me another 15 minutes and I'll build this prototype for you and um, we'll just take a look at it. So off he goes and here's what he comes back with. So here's his prototype and he's so sure that it's going to work he hasn't even tested it yet. He's going to test it right in front of your very eyes because it's just a couple of wires. He's just taken the JK flip-flop and hooked up a switch to it, power and ground, and uh, he's uh, bypassed his, uh, his push-button switch to make sure that it's not too noisy, and we're off to the races. So he plops it down, plugs the power in, and he presses the button. Well, maybe that was just a glitch. Oh, another glitch. Yeah, what was that? It was supposed to toggle and stay on. Uh, what's it doing here? Well, it's kind of working, but hey, what's going on? So it goes, oh, I must have made a mistake in the circuit someplace or whatever. So off he goes, and he tries to find the problem. Well, after some extensive troubleshooting, it's his turn to get that old sinking feeling. Because what he finds out is that he has wired the circuit correctly. But the problem is in this mechanical switch here. And what happens is that this signal coming from the mechanical switch is going into an, an extremely sensitive input on a digital chip, and that's that clock input. That clock edge going into that chip, it will see the very, very smallest down to the microsecond edge or variation in that signal. And as we all know, when you press a mechanical switch, you can get many edges. So what he does is he starts to try to add more capacitors to calm that signal down and to make it quieter. But he never can really get the job done. Because what happens is you start adding too many capacitors, you start to modify the shape of the signal going into that port there. And even though you might get a nice negative dropping edge, which it is seeing as a clock edge, the positive rising edge starts to look like a shark fin, and if you want to press the switch twice in a hurry, then it hasn't really charged up all the way, and all kinds of problems like that. So, he has to abandon this approach. Yes, that engineering manager was a very wise man.
a little bit hard to get a shot of this with all the reflections, but here's an actual capture of one of those edges of that switch closure. Now you can see this is probably a microsecond or something like that. And you can see that this is what's killing that circuit. And this is the kind of interference and noise that is almost impossible to get rid of in a circuit. In synchronous circuits, all of the time critical components are slaved to a master clock. In this schematic, our 555 timer is generating almost a perfect square wave. But even if it's not a perfect square wave, the edges are very clean. So you have a digital device that's talking to a digital device here. So they're speaking the same language and you don't have any of the kind of noise issues that you would have if you're using a mechanical switch or something like that. Now, these other components are the combinatorial logic. Whenever there's a state change here or any change at their inputs, you have these signals rippling through this array of logic and based on the length of wire and the speed of the different gates and even from component to component you find that the gates are different speeds or different gates on the same chip are a little bit different speeds because we're talking about down to the nanosecond and what happens is you get some real instability here on the outputs of some of these gates so what the magic of the synchronous circuit is that that doesn't matter. You allow all of the logic to kind of settle down. You make a state change in the qubits of the flip-flops and then that goes out to the rest of the circuit and the whole circuit is going crazy trying to find its own stability and then finally after a couple of nanoseconds or maybe milliseconds at the longest it's stable again but you see, it's only when the next clock cycle comes that those signals are really important. And by that time, everything is stable at the input of the digital chip. So you don't get into these things called race conditions, or race conditions are when signals are dependent on the speed of the gates and the length of the wiring in order for the stability of the output to be proper. So what about all the problems we had in that other circuit with the mechanical switch? We still have a mechanical switch here. Well, what happens with the synchronous circuit based on the speed of the clock here? You can actually use that to debounce that switch because basically what happens is, sure, you're going to get a lot of noise regardless of how you try to bypass that switch. You're going to get noise at some level. So you press the switch and you get all this noise and it's just like the race conditions in the combinatorial logic. It really doesn't matter a whole lot because whatever this chip sees when it clocks the negative edge off of the master clock, it's going to read that signal. Now, you still have to be a little bit careful because you could get unlucky. But the odds and probability of that happening are reduced tremendously. And if you're just a little bit careful about bypassing this switch over here with maybe a 0.1 and a 0.01 microfarad capacitor, you'll probably be okay. But also what you want to do is consider if you are unlucky enough to catch a tiny little edge of that um, of that switch closure just at the wrong time as this coincides with the master clock negative going edge that the system will absorb that error and not do anything particularly catastrophic, but the odds are much, much, much smaller than uh, our other circuit, and you could see in the other circuit we couldn't even get it to work half the time. Another thing you want to consider is the speed that you run this clock at. You probably want to run it as slow as possible, because if you run it very, very fast, what happens is it has more of a chance of seeing one of these anomalies from that switch. If you run it slow, uh, you just want to run it fast enough to where it doesn't interfere with the human interface. But I have found in this particular circuit that if I run it at about 30 hertz, that's the best. If you start running it down around 5 or 10 hertz, then it actually can miss 
a release of a switch or something. So that's too slow. So you want to find your clock speed that's best to respond to the human interface but also acts as the best debounce for that switch. Alright, let's just end with a list of things we might consider when we're designing a circuit. The circuit should be reliable. It should be as simple as possible with the smallest number of part counts as possible, but again, it needs to be reliable. It needs to be easy to build and manufacture and reliable. It needs to be easy to troubleshoot, debug, service, and repair, and also reliable. It should be inexpensive as practical, with no exotic parts. So even if you get your parts count down, and you have a simple circuit with a small number of parts, if it's difficult to find those parts, or if they're proprietary, or at the end of life cycle, or something like that, that's not very good. So you need to be made out of things other than unobtainium. And, oh yes, did I mention it should be reliable. So how can we be sure that we're taking all the measures we can to produce a reliable circuit? Well, the first thing we want to start out with is a very clear written description that everyone agrees on. From then, we can go on and produce a very clear state diagram that again, everyone agrees on, everybody understands, and everybody believes that this is exactly the kind of solution that you are trying to produce. So once you've got it to this stage, you have really done the majority of the architecture of the design. Now what you do is you go on to your other tools that you have available to you, your next, next state diagram and your Karnoff maps, and then when you produce your circuit, you make sure that you use a good solid synchronous approach so that you don't have any race conditions and you can handle noise as best that you possibly can. By all means, consider other approaches. You should always look at other approaches, but be careful. Watch out for Mr. Gotcha and Murphy's Law. Make sure that you don't run into the law of unintended consequences when you try to simplify something. Make sure that you prototype it and test it. Test every piece of it and try to understand, based on your previous experience, what kind of problems can enter when you're simplifying a design down to its bare bones.